Today on The Matt Walsh Show, guest hosted by yours truly, David Cohn, we will dissect the top five takeaways from the most consequential presidential debate of our lifetime. President Joe Biden was barely functional, and Donald Trump took full advantage. Louisiana parents sue in response to the state's governor signing a new bill into law requiring all public schools display the Ten Commandments in every classroom. The organization PETA launches a new campaign encouraging members to stop having sexual relations with meat eaters, and I will be canceling new LA Lakers head coach J.J. Redick. All of that and more today on The Matt Walsh Show. Saudi Arabia recently ended its 50-year petrodollar deal with the U.S., which has the potential to weaken the U.S. dollar. Since 1974, Saudi Arabia has sold oil solely in U.S. dollars, which was huge for our global economic dominance. Now they want other options. If there is less demand for the U.S. dollar, what happens to its value? It's for reasons like this that I feel it's so important to diversify some of your savings into gold. And you can do that right now with the help of Birch Gold. Right now, qualifying purchases by July 31st are eligible to get a one-of-a-kind limited edition golden truth bomb. That's right. You heard that right. A golden truth bomb. The only way to claim your eligibility is by texting Walsh, W-A-L-S-H to 989898. Protect your savings by diversifying away from the U.S. dollar with gold. Text Walsh to 989898 and Birch Gold will help you convert an old IRA or 401k into an IRA in gold for no money out of pocket zero money out of pocket. Right now, qualifying purchases will get a limited edition golden truth bomb. You don't want to miss that opportunity. Text Walsh to 989898. That's Walsh to 989898 today. If you've made it this far, there's a decent chance you recognize I am in fact, not Matt Walsh, but rather David Cohn from the Daily Wire's illustrious sports show, Crane and Company. Mr. Walsh is on some sort of sabbatical, so you are stuck with me. Last night, America and the entire world got to witness the single most disastrous debate performance by a presidential candidate in the history of this country. That might sound hyperbolic, but think of it this way. Consider all the famous big debate moments from history. George H.W. Bush looking at his watch, Reagan deflecting the attacks about his age, Dukakis flubbing a question about the death penalty. None of those moments are nearly as consequential as what happened yesterday evening. This brings me to the first of my top five takeaways from last night's showdown, and that is President Biden is done. He can't be the Democratic nominee. I will stop short of saying that he won't be the nominee because we still have the convention to go. Things can get weird with delegates and superdelegates. But I am confident in saying he cannot be the Democratic nominee, not while remaining in the state we witnessed on national television, not if Democrats plan to hold the presidency. Let's begin from the very top. I thought for sure, as did many, President Biden would come out and start if not strong, at least competent, given the adrenaline rush of the moment, and then sort of fade as the 90 minutes went on. I could not have been more wrong. This was a disaster, even from the walkout. Let's watch it together. Please welcome the 45th president of the United States, Donald Trump. The contrast was immediately obvious. Joe Biden looked like a person 
who was on his last legs. I don't know how else to say it. His voice was muffled, muted. He looks lost. Then Trump walks out on stage, red tie, projecting exactly the opposite image. I mean, Trump looked like a man running for president. Joe Biden looked like a ghost. Look, I'm an American. This this hurts me to watch. I am at a point in life where I agree with Joe Biden on just about nothing. I guess we both like ice cream, and that's about it. But he's still the president of the United States, and I'm still an American. I point out this cognitive collapse not to attack Joe Biden personally. We all get older. It's a fact of life. But to protect our country from an incapacitated leader, this man is auditioning to be president for another four years. And it is well past time for the people in his life, the people who hopefully care about him, to step in. Unfortunately, that doesn't appear to be a likely outcome. Upon the conclusion of this evening, Jill Biden was caught ushering her husband off the stage. Then at a post-debate function, she spoke to him as if he were a, a small child. See for yourself. The first debate of the 2024 campaign and the earliest presidential debate ever now in the books and in front of the voters. I mean, look at this. He can't get off the stage by himself. That's the president of the United States. And swing state focus group. We'll be talking to surrogates, including Vice President Harris, getting fact checks from our Daniel Dale and new reporting. The wide shot there from the stage. Such a great job. You answered every question. You knew all the facts. You answered every question. That's the bar, y'all. You an- look at his face. You answered every question. There's no commentary necessary, really. I mean, Mr. Walsh pointed out last night on Backstage, Jill Biden is a candidate for worst wife in America due to her refusal to help end this maltreatment. Even the legacy media, the corporate press, high-level Democrats, CNN, MSNBC, were all seriously suggesting, immediately following his performance for the first time ever, that Joe Biden step aside. Gavin Newsom was out speaking to reporters with the biggest grin on his face that you have ever seen. Nothing like this has ever happened in the immediate aftermath of a presidential debate. This is a debacle of the highest order. We have a saying on our sports show craning company, trust Vegas. Biden's odds to take back the White House plummeted on every single betting market that I checked, some having his chances fall a full 15%. Even the odds for winning the nomination fell in real time as the debate went on. At one point, Biden claimed he had the endorsement of the Border Patrol, only for Trump to call him out on it during the rebuttal, and then for the Border Patrol Union to deny that endorsement mid-debate, stating on X, verbatim, to be clear, we have never and will never endorse Biden. There are so many moments like this that we could play clips for the remainder of the day. Perhaps the worst moment came during a response to Social Security. I know this is difficult to watch, but watch it we must. Please play it. Making sure that we're able to make every single solitary person eligible for what I've been able to do with the uh, with, with, with the COVID, excuse me, with um, dealing with everything we have to do with, uh, look, if we finally beat Medicare. Mm. Thank you, President uh, Biden. President mm. Trump? Well, he's right. He did beat Medicare. He beat it to death, and he's destroying Medicare. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't mean to laugh, but I mean, this is when, behind the scenes, Democrats started panicking. The president of the United States clearly cannot finish his own sentences. No one was interrupting him. There was no audience to distract him. This is the current reality, even when the conditions are heavily tilted in his favor. This is exactly the kind of thing that led Robert Hur, the DOJ special counsel, to write that Joe Biden is so elderly that it would be hard to bring criminal charges against him. Democrats spent the last few months denying those claims, lying about those claims, and yet here we are, the tangible truth laid bare before the world. 
Even when Joe Biden was able to articulate his thoughts, he ended up shooting himself in the foot. That was evident during the discussion uh, on inflation, for example. Watch this. There was no inflation when I became president. You know why? The economy was flat on its back. 15% unemployment. He decimated the economy. Absolutely decimated the economy. That's why there was no inflation. And he caused the inflation. He's blaming inflation. And he's right, it's been very bad. He caused the inflation, and it's killing black families and Hispanic families and just about everybody. It's killing people. They can't buy groceries anymore. They can't. You look at the cost of food where it's doubled and tripled and quadrupled. They can't live. They're not living anymore. He caused this inflation. I gave him a country with no, essentially no inflation. It was perfect. It was so good. All he had to do is leave it alone. He destroyed it with his Green News scam and all of the other, all this money that's being thrown out the window. He caused inflation. As sure as you're sitting there. So you just saw Joe Biden admit that when he took office, there was no inflation. We must realize the implications of that statement. Inflation is the number one issue on voters' minds right now. We're reminded of inflation every time we go to the grocery store or out to eat, and Joe Biden straight up admits that when he took office, there was no inflation. Now, I'm going to be as fair as possible. Joe Biden's point was that as people get jobs, then inflation tends to go up because there's more money circulating. And it's true that as COVID died down, people return to work. The problem is this, Joe Biden is ignoring the trillions of dollars, new spending, and all that money printing that occurred under his administration. This spending and money printing clearly made inflation worse. Here's a fun fact that's not mentioned nearly enough. The money supply in the United States hit an all-time high in April of 2022 when Joe Biden was in office. This is Economics 101. When you have more of something, its value declines. Printing money leads to inflation. That's what we have now. And that's not to say Donald Trump has been uh, you know, perfect on spending, but Joe Biden's record is worse, which is why he couldn't defend it. Now, to stay fair, as the debate went on, Biden performed a bit better. I'd say around the midpoint is when he seemed to get into some kind of a a groove, if you can even call it that. Clearly, the bar has been lowered to such an extent that his simple completion of sentences comes off as some small victory in moments. Uh, needless to say, that should not be the standard for the president of the United States. I mean, it was truly striking how much Biden struggled to communicate his most basic talking points, even on January 6th, okay, which is a topic that Democrats have been hammering for years now. Here is how the exchange transpired. He encouraged those folks to go up on Capitol Hill, number one. I sat in the dining room off the Oval Office. He sat there for three hours, three hours watching, begging, being begged by his vice president and a number of his colleagues on the Republican side as well to do something, to call for a stop, to end it. Instead, he talked, they talked about these people being patriots and, and, and great patrons of America. In fact, he says he'll now forgive them for what they've done. He'll, They've been convicted. He says he wants to commute their sentences and say that, that no. But he went to every single court in the nation. I don't know how many cases, scores of cases, including the Supreme Court. And they said, they said, no, no, this guy, this guy is responsible for doing what is being, what was done. He did do a damn thing. And these people should be in jail. And they should be the ones who are being held accountable. And he wants to let them all out. And now he says if he loses again, such a whiner that he is, that it could be a bloodbath. Thank you, President Biden. That. And let me tell you about January 6th. On January 6th, we had a great border. Mm -hmm. Nobody coming through, very few. On January 6th, we were energy independent. Mm -hmm. On January 6th, we had the lowest taxes ever. We had the lowest regulations ever. On January 6th, we were respected all over the world. Smart all answer. All over the world, we were respected. And then he comes in, and we're now laughed at. We're like a bunch of stupid people. The, what happened to the United States' reputation under this man's leadership is horrible. 
So even there, in moments where Biden isn't completely short-circuiting, he's mumbling incoherently. Then Trump turns the entire line of attack around, deflecting it perfectly, and then went on to point out correctly that he repeatedly told protesters not to engage in any violence on January 6th. Really, it's hard to shake the feeling that last night's event was intended to produce this result by exposing Joe Biden's cognitive decline to the entire world. I mean, think about it this way. Why else would this debate have been scheduled in June before the Democrats nominating convention? This was the earliest presidential debate in US history to ever take place in an election year. By far, the previous record holder for earliest debate in an election year was mid-September of 1980. I mean, not to get too conspiratorial, but if you wanted to sabotage Joe Biden's candidacy, this would be a really good way to do it. They managed to kneecap him right before the convention. If that's the case, if Joe Biden is being sabotaged, then I expect we'll see a new candidate quickly. We would would need to see a new candidate quickly. Democrats will also likely intensify their efforts to imprison Donald Trump, because at this point, Uh, it's fairly clear they're running out of options. And this, this brings me to my second takeaway. Donald Trump won the debate. And the fact that that is the second conclusion behind Joe Biden's cognitive inability is really a double win. I mean, one of my main thoughts prior to last night was President Biden can perform poorly or not even at all, yet still win the night if Donald Trump comes off as overly antagonistic. He could have shouted or lost his temper or tried to talk over Biden, which was a habit we all remember from the debate last time around. Uh, Trump could have bullied Biden or resorted to personal insults. This was not the case, and Trump deserves a lot of credit for performing well, especially in the first 28 minutes of the debate or so. Donald Trump put on a master class. And I say this as someone who was very late to the Trump train eight years ago. Last night, especially early on, he was composed, presidential. He didn't waste the opportunities or the openings he was given. And not a single topic went by without Donald Trump hammering Joe Biden on immigration. It was a constant talking point. And here's one of Trump's best moments for the entire evening. Let's watch. Move until we get the total ban on the, 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 the total initiative relative to what we're going to do with more border patrol and more uh, asylum officers. President Trump? Uh, I really don't know what he said at the end of that sentence. I don't think he knows what he said either. Look. I mean, that's a heavyweight right hook, but delivered in such a way that's honest. It doesn't come off as bullying. It's what the American people are thinking. Now, as the debate went on past the 30-minute mark, that's when Trump how should I say, went off the rails a bit. I mean, he was much less responsive to the questions being asked, choosing instead to dodge them and hammer Biden on previous responses. To be fair, that was around the time that I felt the moderator started to let their bias show a bit more in terms of questioning. But make no mistake, Trump knew he was winning. He knew he had Joe Biden in the corner and being the heavyweight prize fighter that he is, he just kept throwing punches. Now, speaking of moderators, my third takeaway is that Jake Tapper and Dana Bash deserve kudos. Yes, they're clearly biased. They've previously said very unfair and nasty things about Donald Trump. But in this case, they did a worthy job, especially for the first 30 minutes, which is really the most critical. That's when the most eyeballs are tuned in. Once the questions got into climate crisis and threats to democracy, it seemed a bit skewed, but they didn't open the debate with any sort of slanted distraction. They focused on the issues that mattered, like inflation. And once the debate ended, CNN's analysts didn't try to spin it. They directly told their viewers that Joe Biden's performance was a disaster. Watch this. It was a game-changing debate in the sense that right now, as we speak, there is a deep, a wide, and a very aggressive panic in the Democratic Party. It started minutes into the debate, and it continues right now. It involves party strategists, it involves elected officials, it involves fundraisers. And they're having conversations about the president's performance, which they think was dismal, which they think will hurt other people down the party in the ticket, and they're having conversations about what they should do about it. Some of those conversations include, should we go to the White House and ask the president to step aside? Others are, other of the conversations are about, should prominent Democrats go public hmm. with that call? 
because they feel this debate was so terrible. Uh, they do say in, in moments in the debate later, the president got better and got his footing. But then at the end, even his closing statement was a little halting. That's one of the rare moments of honesty you'll find from CNN. And it came at an important time. The world is watching. With all of that said, CNN and most other legacy media outlets have spent years now trying to shame anyone who even dares make mention, who dares even question Joe Biden's ability to serve as president. So they brought this on themselves. Unless, of course, this is all part of a larger plan to replace Biden as the nominee. Now, there was another viral moment following the debate. This is when a CNN panelist appeared to say that Joe Biden was given the questions in advance. Let's take a look together. He goes through six days of preparation at Camp David. More than that. And they know the rules. It was more than a week. Okay. They, and so more than a week. They know the rules. He practices with the mics. He knows every one of these questions is coming. And yet he couldn't fill the time. Now, they, I, I just want to, let's see what the White House is saying. Sources close to the White House are saying he had a cold, wasn't feeling well. I mean, as you would expect, that came out early on in the debate. But what accounts for someone with so much experience doing so much I, preparation I think, and this I being think, the outcome? Honestly, I think the question answers itself. He wasn't capable of doing any better than he did. Bingo. Bingo. Now, would it surprise any of us if CNN gave Joe Biden the debate questions in advance? Of course not. Honestly, I'm at the point I would be surprised if they didn't leak them to his camp. At the same time, I think it's likely that she means all questions of this nature should have been anticipated by any rational candidate. Either way, it's certainly not the best of phrasing for sure. Two final thoughts here regarding CNN, and these are very important for Trump's team to understand and remember moving forward. Forward. Every aspect of last night's debate format, in theory, should have benefited Joe Biden. First, there was no live audience, and we all know how much Donald Trump loves playing to a live audience. Additionally, Trump loves to interject during debates, name call, but in this case, the mics were cut off following each candidate's remarks. If the goal was to undermine Donald Trump's game plan or to limit his strengths, then the strategy backfired. Without a live audience, Trump wasn't motivated to play to the crowd. And because his microphone was muted after each answer, he didn't get bogged down with crosstalk. Both of these format decisions allowed Trump to stay more focused and more importantly, to not come off as overly antagonistic. Now, Trump being a bully on stage, that may have been fun for many across the country, but not for the people he's trying to win over, not for the suburban house wives, not for the centrists, not for those key independents. My fourth takeaway of the night is about Donald Trump's response to the abortion question he was asked. Here's part of what he said. So well, the Supreme Court just approved the abortion pill, and I agree with their decision to have done that, and I will not block it. And if you look at this whole question that you're asking, a complex but not really complex, 51 years ago, you had Roe v. Wade, and everybody wanted to get it back to the states, everybody, without exception. Democrats, Republicans, liberals, conservatives, everybody wanted it back, religious leaders. And what I did is I put three great Supreme Court justices on the court, and they happened to vote in favor of killing Roe v. Wade and moving it back to the states. Like Ronald Reagan, I believe in the exceptions. I am a person that believes. And frankly, I think it's important to believe in the exceptions. Some people, you have to follow your heart. Some people don't believe in that. But I believe in the exceptions for rape, incest, and the life of the mother. I think it's very important. Some people don't. Follow your heart. But you have to get elected also. And because that has to do with other things. you got to get elected. Seven states have no legal restrictions on how far into a pregnancy a woman can obtain an abortion. Do you support any legal limits on how late a woman should be able to terminate a pregnancy? I support Roe v. Wade, which had three trimesters. What, First what? time is between the woman and the doctor. Second time is between the doctor what? and an extreme situation. The third time is between the doctor, I mean, be between the, the woman and the state. The idea that the politicians, the, the, that the founders wanted the politicians to be the ones making decisions about women's health is ridiculous. That's the last. No politician should be making that decision. A doctor should be making those decisions. That's how it should be run. That's what you're going to do. And if I'm elected, I'm going to restore Roe v. Wade. So that means he can take the life of the baby in the ninth month and even after birth, because some states, Democrat-run, 
take it after birth. Again, the governor, former governor of Virginia, put the baby down, then we decide what to do with it. So he's, in, he's willing to, as we say, rip the baby out of the womb in the ninth month and kill the baby. Hmm. Nobody better, wants that better, to happen. That's better. Uh, th- this is a topic that's deeply personal to me. I have three babies under three years old. The gentleman who usually occupies this chair has double that amount. Many of you listening are in similar positions. There should be a tremendous sense of gratitude for Donald Trump appointing justices to the court that overturned Roe versus Wade, quite possibly the most significant Supreme Court case of our time. With that said, we must discuss Trump's response to the topic of abortion pills. Firstly, he claimed that the Supreme Court had approved the abortion pill. Technically, that's not true. The Supreme Court dismissed a challenge involving abortion due to a standing issue, which essentially means that they didn't decide the case on its merits. Secondly, Trump appeared to say that because of the Supreme Court's ruling, he wouldn't block the abortion pill in any way. Look, I'm well aware of the Trump campaign's position here. They are making a political calculation. They're sizing up up the political realities, and they've come to the conclusion that they can't win the White House if they campaign on a total abortion pill ban. Pro-life conservatives don't want to hear that answer. We want a president to unapologetically support the sanctity of life. At the same time, when I hear Donald Trump say the phrase multiple times in an answer, you got to get elected, you got to get elected, to me that's code for, hey, Everybody has been yelling at me for not winning over more independent voters, so that's what I'm doing here. Traditional conservatives, trust my record as president. Trust the justices I placed on the highest court in the land. I got Roe overturned when no other Republican could. That message was clear. Now, is it disappointing of all the issues to run towards the center for this to be the one? Is this a disappointing answer for many of us? Absolutely. Trump clearly, though, feels this is the right move politically to return to Washington, and we all just have to hope he does the right thing if he gets back in office. For my fifth and final takeaway, which is a a bit lighter than the others, I have to say, watching Donald Trump and Joe Biden, two octogenarians, argue back and forth over their golf handicaps was the most American thing I've ever seen, for better or worse. In case you missed it, here was the incredible moment. Just take a look at what he says he is and take a look at what he is. Look, I'd be happy to have a driving contest with him. The reason I got my handicap, which when I was vice president, down to a six. Six? And, and look at by the way, I told you before, I'm happy to play golf with you if you carry your own bag. You can do it. That's the biggest lie that he's a six handicap of all. I was an eight handicap. Yeah. Eight. Now it's eight. Never. From six to eight. Really I've seen you swing. I know you swing. Yeah, let's let's not act like around. children. President Trump, we're going to Let's around. not act like children. <laughs> Think about all the serious issues facing this country from inflation, foreign policy, foreign wars, the national debt, yet these two guys are going back and forth arguing about who would win on the golf course. And of the many lies told on that stage, Joe Biden's claim to be a six handicap while needing to be physically escorted off the stage by his wife may be the biggest whopper of them all. Now, I played golf for the first time this year or in a year over Memorial Day, and I shot 99. Joe Biden has never been a six handicap in his life. Honestly, if I were President Biden in that state that he was in last night, I would steer clear of even mentioning the word handicap. Now, I'll wrap this up by sharing the overarching sentiment I arrived at after watching this unforgettable debate. And after speaking with several friends last night, many of whom who don't even follow politics closely, most of us didn't learn anything new about Donald Trump. Trump was Trump. Everything he showcased, love it or hate it, has been baked into the Trump cake for a long time now. But millions of people learned something new about Joe Biden. Millions of people saw firsthand the cognitive impairments that had been, at least for many up to this point, dismissed as right-wing propaganda or hateful conservative rhetoric. This was the night that the election changed. 
I can't know for sure that Joe Biden won't be the nominee, but I do know that as a matter of physical and mental ability, he simply can't be the nominee. Joe Biden is not running the country right now, and no matter what happens in this election, he won't be running it in the future. The choice is now between electing Donald Trump or electing a cabal of unelected, behind the scenes bureaucrats who really call the shots. That's been the choice effectively for several years now. But after last night, that choice is now obvious to every single voter in the country. Now let's get to our five headlines. Are you still struggling with back taxes or unfiled returns? The IRS is escalating collections by adding 20,000 new agents. I repeat, 20 thousand new IRS agents and sending millions of demand letters. Handling this alone can be a huge mistake and cost you thousands of dollars. In these challenging times, your best defense is with Tax Network USA. With over 14 years of experience, the experts at Tax Network USA have saved clients millions in back taxes. Regardless of the size of your tax issue, their expertise is your advantage. Tax Network USA USA offers three key services, protection, compliance, and then settlement. Now, upon signing up, Tax Network USA will immediately contact the IRS to secure a protection order, ensuring that aggressive collection activities such as garnishments, levies, or property seizures are halted. So if you haven't filed in a while, need amended returns, or are missing records, Tax Network USA's expert tax preparers will update all of your filings to eliminate the risk of IRS enforcement. Then they'll create a settlement strategy to reduce or eliminate your tax debt. The IRS is the largest collection agency in the world. And now that tax season is over, collection season has begun. Tax Network USA can even help with state tax issues. Don't wait any longer. Call my friends at Tax Network USA today for a complimentary consultation. Call 1-800-245-6000 or visit tnusa.com slash Walsh. That's 1-800-245-6000 or visit tn-usa.com slash Walsh today. First story up is about PETA. I want to read you this article here. This is from Blaze Media. Uh, the headline is, PETA calls on people to stop having sex with meat-eating men. I never wanted to eat a steak more in my life than, than right now. People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals uh, have, has announced a campaign to persuade people to stop having sex with meat-eating men after a study found a large gender gap in vegan diets. A spokesperson for PETA released a statement explaining the campaign. PETA urges lovers everywhere to ditch deadly meat because men apparently don't give more profanity here, about the planet as a new study shows that males contribute significantly more to the climate catastrophe than females through their higher consumption of meat. PETA is asking people to, uh, again, more profanity. I'll just, I'll stop right here for a second. PETA is the epitome of an inverted society, right? I mean, every member of this hateful organization should thank their ancestors for eating meat. Can you imagine if, if, if the PETA organization members, great, 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 great grandfathers decided, hey, I want to up in the natural order of everything that my lineage has done up to this point, and I'd like to stop eating meat. No PETA member would be alive right now. Uh, this article goes on to say, uh, the new study found that among societies where men and women were given more freedom to choose their diets, men were far more likely to choose meat diets than vegan ones, while women were more open to choosing vegan and vegetarian. Uh, is that surprising? Is anyone truly surprised by that? I mean, PETA is breeding grounds for, for lunatics. The, these are the same people who use the term fur babies, right? Like, like what kind of term is that? Now, I love animals. I have a dog. I love my dog. My dog is uh, Penny Lane, the pit bull. 
Like any type of person who doesn't love pit bulls is sort of a sociopath to me. That's that's what I think. But I wouldn't go around calling Penny my fur baby. Actually, I, I can't even think of a more disrespectful thing to say to the dog that really gets treated like a princess in our house. Uh, this is the same group, PETA, that tried to cancel the University of Georgia's English bulldog mascot, Ugga on multiple occasions at this point, uh, stating as the back-to-back national champions, this was a, this was a year ago, uh, can't Ugga find in its heart to honestly examine the impact as back-to-back national champions, can't UGA find in its heart to honestly examine the impact of its promotion of defending deformed dogs and call time on its outdated live animal mascot program? It's almost, it's almost unreadable to be honest with you. Do you know how well Ugga lives? Do you know the lifestyle of this dog? He has his own custom-made Chevy Suburban with a personalized license plate. That's more than I get. A state-of-the-art, air-conditioned, eco-friendly, I may add, doghouse for the football games he attends. When he's not in there, he's taking pictures with the cheerleaders. And when each Ugga dog passes, he is entombed in a marble mausoleum. That's royalty. That dog's royalty. And you have the audacity, PETA, to call him deformed. I'm convinced PETA members are the ones who actually hate animals. There's no way you can be the arbiter of of which animals get to live and which ones must die because you think that they are deformed. Uh, It's disgusting to me. And in terms of PETA making a commitment to uh, stop having sex with men who are meat eaters, uh, I fully support this decision and I would encourage them to stop procreating at all cost. All right, next story up here uh, is titled, Picasso's hung in toilet cubicle at Mona in response to adverse discrimination ruling. So this one comes from uh, producer Sean. And producer Sean back there, you tell me if I'm off track here, but a museum wanted to hang Picasso paintings up, but only wanted females, only wanted women to be able to come in and enjoy and view the Picasso paintings. No men uh, allowed. So this resulted in a lawsuit from one man who wanted to come in and and see what the Picasso paintings were all about. So the curator created a loophole called the Ladies' Lounge and said she would consider using this loophole and turning it into a toilet to enable men not to be able to come in to this art gallery. So look, there there are several things uh, at play here. First of all, we have a situation where is the free market better than legislation? I mean, first of all, that is typically my response to these situations. Hey, I want to let the free market act in a way that is best for it. If that includes discrimination, then allow businesses or museums to punish themselves and go out of business. I mean, this is a, a historically what happened, let's say, with the NFL. NFL owners didn't want to let minority races play in the league until they find out, hey, we're losing every single game. We have to integrate or else we're gonna go out of business. This is the example here. Um, But what is amazing to me is the constant double standard. Hey, we wanna create a, a, a toilet lounge, a toilet lounge where no men can come in and look at these Picasso paintings, but if that man who can't come in wants to go to his country club clubhouse where no women can come in, he wants to smoke cigars or play poker, then that is discriminatory. How is that not a double standard? Uh, Not only that, but uh, now all of a sudden we're back to knowing what a woman is, right? Like, isn't isn't it amazing that anytime it's convenient to display any traditional understanding of the way the world works and has worked for millennia, then uh, all of a sudden we know what a woman is, we know what a woman's bathroom is, we know who's supposed to go into that bathroom, and we know who's supposed to be kept out of that bathroom. It's further proof that the gender ideology uh, is absolute madness. This isn't about equality. This isn't about feelings. This is about destroying boundaries. Until we need some of those boundaries, of course, to discriminate against men, then we are, we're more than fine with that. And uh, you can't come in and see the Picassos. Next up, as Mr. Walsh pointed out Friday a week ago, 
uh, Louisiana became the first state to require that the Ten Commandments be displayed in every public school classroom. The legislation that Republican Governor Jeff Landry signed into law the previous Wednesday requires a poster-sized display of the Ten Commandments in large, easily readable font in all classrooms, from kindergarten to state-funded universities. So this week, we now have Louisiana parents sue to block display of Ten Commandments in school. A group of parents in Louisiana filed a federal lawsuit on Monday seeking to block a new state law requiring that the Ten Commandments be posted in every public school. The American Civil Liberties Union of Louisiana, of course we would get to them, one of the organizations representing the parents has condemned the legislation as blatantly unconstitutional. But the law supporters were eager for a legal fight which they hoped would bring the issue to the U.S. Supreme Court. They were optimistic that the court's conservative majority would support the mandate and overturn a 1980 ruling that struck down a similar law. The plaintiffs in the lawsuit filed on Monday in federal district court in Baton Rouge. Uh, There are nine families with children in Louisiana public schools. They include two Unitarian Universalist families, a Presbyterian family, a Jewish family, an atheist family, and non-religious family. Isn't that redundant towards the end there? Uh, In the lawsuit, the families assert that having the Ten Commandments posted in every elementary, secondary, or post-secondary public school classroom would render them unavoidable. As a result, According to the suit, the law unconstitutionally pressures students into religious observance, veneration, and adoption of the state's favored religious scripture. Unconstitutionally pressures students into religious observance. That is a heck of a statement to make in a lawsuit in a time where the Rainbow Coalition is is spewing alphabet propaganda, LGBT propaganda, and putting up rainbow flags of, of any kind of nature in classrooms across this country without a single word. I, I would like to know, would any of these parents sue the school district or sue the state if they had a rainbow flag or a Black Lives Matter flag post Posted up in their classroom. You know, I, I, I was talking about this issue um, last year with my good friend and colleague here, Spencer Clavin, when the Los Angeles Dodgers baseball team decided to host the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. Not, not just host them at a baseball game, gave them a community service award of some, of some sort. Uh, and, you know, we were talking about, is that a way for the, this leftist lunacy to sort of barter or demand a trade. Well, if you don't want us to have the sisters of perpetual indulgence at the baseball game, then don't have the sisters of the poor at the baseball game. Or to say, if you don't want rainbow flags in the classroom, then don't put up the Ten Commandments in the classroom. And I thought, you know, Spencer said something really poignant, which was, do not retreat to neutrality. Right, like, like there. If we can't, as a society, set a moral distinction between the sisters of perpetual indulgence, a drag queen operation, a difference between that and the sisters of the poor, even though you may not be Catholic, if you can't understand the moral distinction of that when you see it at the baseball game then society has collapsed. If you can't walk into a public school classroom, public school where our funding goes, where our dollar bills go, where our taxed income goes, if you can't walk into the classroom and understand the distinction between the Ten Commandments on the wall, even though you may not be religious, you may not be Christian, if that bothers you to such an extent, but you're completely fine looking at a rainbow-colored flag that supports all sorts of sexual deviancy, uh, which is its own sort of it's becoming its own sort of religion, or at least a cult might be a better word. Uh, then, then how far has society fallen if we can't understand those sorts of distinctions? So this is a big issue. I know Mr. Walsh touched on it last week. Now we have Louisiana parents set to sue, which the governor was anticipating, and now it's happened. So we'll keep you posted on that moving forward.
If you haven't heard, Jeremy Boring announced an exciting partnership with Angel Studios and Daily Wire Plus to bring you a brand new film called Sound of Hope, the story of Possum Trot. And it's coming to theaters this July 4th. I've seen the film. I greatly enjoyed the film. Last year, Angel Studios' movie Sound of Freedom made a profound impact by shining a powerful light on the child trafficking crisis. Now, Angel Studios is back, continuing their fight for kids, and Daily Wire is joining them. Sound of Hope is the true story of 22 families from a rural church who adopted 27 kids from the foster system, sparking a movement to save vulnerable children everywhere. We have a trailer for you guys so you can get a feel for what this movie is all about. Please take a look. Are you sure these people want us? I know they do. You can call me mama. Lord. If we can't wrap our arms around the most vulnerable, then what are we at? Noise! Oh. And the children can't take the noise anymore. This is something that we must do. 22 families want to adopt. Whole town wants kids now. <laughs> That's about right. What's happening with Possum Trot could mean a huge change for the system. Now, I watched this film, as I said, and I have to say it is incredibly moving and it places strong family values at its core. It's more than just a movie. It's, it's a call to action. Right now, there are over 100,000 children in foster care that need homes and they need our help. Raising awareness is how you can help today. The best way to do that is by seeing Sound of Hope in theaters. This is exactly how we start a movement to change culture. Sound of Hope is coming to theaters July 4th, and tickets, they are on sale now. You can get showtimes at angel.com slash Matt. Now let's get to our daily cancellation. Many of you may remember J.J. Redick as a standout basketball player at Duke University, or as a 15-year NBA veteran, or as a sports personality for the insufferable network that is ESPN. Well, as of this week, Redick has officially been announced as the 29th head coach of the Los Angeles Lakers. And during his very first introductory press conference, Redick was asked a question that wasn't particularly shocking or difficult to handle, but his response made headlines regardless. Here's the question followed by Redick's response. Watch this. Hey, JJ, Claire Dillon with The Guardian. First of all, sorry, right in front of you. First of all, happy birthday. Um, second of all, what misconceptions or concerns about you that you've heard in the last few weeks are you the most like looking forward to dispelling when you're the coach? Um, it's a valid question, and I've certainly heard everything. Um, you know, it's it's been a really interesting uh, six weeks or so, um, just in terms of. Uh, you know, being part of the engagement farming uh, industry, engagement you know, farming. it's been really interesting. Um, however, I, I, I don't really have a great answer for your uh, question because I, I really don't give a f Like, honestly, I want to coach the Lakers. I want to coach the team. I don't want to dispel anything. I don't. Mm. At first, I thought for sure this was some AI manipulated deep fake. But no, JJ Reddick really dropped the F word during his initial public address with the Los Angeles Lakers completely out of the blue. In fact, he said it again later on in the same answer. This is how he chose to introduce himself to the country and to millions of Lakers fans around the world. Now, the Lakers went from coaches like Bill Sharman and Pat Riley to this. There's really no other way to describe that moment other than the personification 
of unprofessionalism. Not to be too dramatic, but you have to ask, is this how far our societal standards have fallen? Are we really at the point where the new head coach for one of the most storied franchises in the National Basketball Association can use profanity of this nature on national television in his inaugural press conference? Now, from the reaction to Reddick's vulgar response, it seems that unfortunately we are indeed at that point. Many sports journalists even cheered his language and attacked people who were bothered by it. This is Garrett Seawright at Barrett Sports Media, for example, uh, declared that we should welcome Reddick's honesty and his decision to be unapologetically himself. He accused people criticizing Reddick's remarks of, quote, pure insanity and being holier than thou. Seawright added, quote, but for sports reporters and hosts to pretend as if it were some great blunder, one that simply is unconscionable for an NBA head coach to blurt out, couldn't be more ridiculous. That's right. Ridiculous, insane. That's what they think of you if you take issue with this sort of language. Meanwhile, Zach Gelb was even more zealous in defense of J.J. Reddick. He delivered a full throated defense of the constitutional right of Lakers coach to drop F-bombs and violate all kinds of FCC rules whenever they please. If you want to see what a straw man fallacy looks like in real time, here is your chance. Let's watch it together. So J.J. Reddick drops one F-bomb in the press conference, and, and you would have thought that J.J. Reddick was like the worst human being in the world. I can't believe now, Stu. I'm defending J.J. Reddick. I can't stand the man's guts. He's insufferable. He's a pompous ass. Don't get me wrong. But people pretending as if he committed some crime yesterday because he dropped an F-bomb in the press conference? Get over yourself. Toughen up a little bit. Oh, Toughen what up. about the children? All oh, the children are listening. So if you don't like that language... Be a parent, lecture your children, and tell them you don't speak that way in public. But how people are making this out to be as if J.J. Reddick is the worst human being to ever walk the, 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 the face of the earth because he dropped an F-bomb is ridiculous. Yeah, there's a lot of passion there, that's for sure, but it's not really clear who Zach Gelb is talking to. No one watched this interaction and said J.J. Reddick committed a crime or that he's the worst person ever to live. What people are saying, myself included, is that J.J. Reddick did something that was highly inappropriate. And more than that, his press conference was a symbol for how professionalism in all contexts, not just in sports, is dying in this country. That used to be something people cared about, but increasingly, they do not. That's especially clear if you take a look at social media. Jamal Christopher, for example, wrote, quote, grown men crying about J.J. Reddick dropping the F-bomb, crazy times we live in. Again, crazy, insane. You see these words they want to call us? The host of Football Talk added, people losing their mind over an F-bomb is wild to me. Another one here, J.J. Reddick dropping F-bombs in his press conference, I'm sold, love the hire. I guess we shouldn't be too surprised. Social media is the cesspool of our time. But how about Rob Palenka? The general manager for the franchise is sitting right beside Reddick. No rebuttal, no comment, no apology. There's no word from the team owner, Jeannie Buss. There's no statement from the Lakers PR. At least we got a solid response from Michael Kay. I wasn't familiar with this gentleman, but he made the same point that crossed my mind when I first saw this. So let's watch it together. Oh, I'm going to be the old guy on the lawn. Yes. Just shouting at clouds. Yeah, well, yeah. And you know what? Yeah. Maybe I am sometimes. But when Peter, who's young and hip and fresh, <laughs> if he brings it up, it kind of opens the door for me just a little bit to, to climb through. A little bit. The portal. What, what exactly has happened to the coarsening of our society? Yep. Where a guy who went to Duke, a bright guy, just drops an F bomb. Why on live TV? Why do you? Why is, is that okay now? Is that okay? No. So maybe the FCC no. should change all these rules too. I mean, this guy just dropped it, and it's not just JJ Reddick, but this is a man of authority right now. It's, people use the F word like it's nothing now. 
Yep. Kay went on to say correctly that young kids could have been watching that press conference. And this isn't even the kind of behavior that we want our kids to be modeling, obviously. To be clear, it's not as if J.J. Redick were yelling at a player on the basketball court and a microphone picked up the profanity. It's not like he got cornered in the locker room after a tough loss by a hostile reporter making inflammatory comments. Not that that vulgarity in any situation is defensive. But it's certainly more understandable. A general will address his troops in battle differently than he speaks to the public. And don't get me wrong, I'm not claiming to be someone who never uses foul language. I've said far worse phrases in my life. I've used that exact term probably at some point this week. I'll probably use it again in the future, but I wouldn't say it during the most important public interactions of my life. I would hope that if I use this language during my first interview with Jeremy Boring and Ben Shapiro, that they would have stopped me straight away and shown me the door. Hearing Reddick say this while being introduced for his first ever head coaching gig, or assistant coaching gig if you think LeBron James is the head coach, it got me thinking back to a Deadspin article I read several years ago. Now, Deadspin has become such a useless publication that it's been sold off more times than old baseball cards. So take this with a grain of salt. But the headline for the column is, How J.J. Reddick's Abortion Contract was conceived. In the piece, Barry Petschke alleges, quote, in 2007, J.J. Reddick's first year in the NBA, he and his model ex-girlfriend, Vanessa Lopez, agreed to a bizarre contract which stipulated Reddick would have to fake a relationship with Lopez for one full year or pay her $25,000, either one, in exchange for her getting an abortion. A series of emails were then released between Reddick, his attorney, Greg McNeil, and financial advisor, Jeff Silverman, in which they allegedly debated about the exact wording and version of the contract. Both parties eventually signed one of these versions, according to the report, just hours before Lopez terminated her pregnancy, which the physician identified as being 16 to 17 weeks along. Now, I've witnessed firsthand people extort money from high-profile athletes and celebrities, and that could be the case here. I'm not vouching for any of these allegations, but this episode does underscore why it's so important to live your life in such a manner that your character is beyond questioning. It's important to carry yourself appropriately as often as possible and never give anyone reason to doubt your integrity. Saying the F word on the grandest stage of your career does not help that cause. Apparently, though, this is just life in 2024. Forget the bar for professional standards being low. There is no bar. All words are the same, they carry no meaning, they have no weight, we're all just living in a giant undergrad philosophy class. Every word is just made up of the same 26 letters, we're just making different noises with our mouths. What's the big deal? This is the mindset of the boundary list. Words don't matter, men can be women, nations don't really exist. This is the regressive nihilism we are fighting on a daily basis. So y'all can call me an old curmudgeon, the get off my lawn guy, lame, but I'll tell you what I find lame, watching someone with zero respect for himself, his family, his name, the organization welcoming him in to the point that he behaves like this in an environment that should be fit for our children to watch. That's why J.J. Reddick and all the many defenders of his classless and inexcusable behavior are today canceled. I need to get off my lawn. That'll do it today for the Matt Wall Show. Thanks so much for tuning in. Before you go quickly, I do have a shameless plug. I have a brand new song out this morning. That's right, I wrote it, I sing it. It's called Southward Bound. It was produced by Nashville legend Kent Wells. I encourage you to go listen to it and download it. You can get it on Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, anywhere where you traditionally listen to music. You can also catch me in about a half hour on the sports show Crane & Company. That'll be 3 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Central. Thank you so much for watching and listening. I'm David Cohn, guest hosting for Matt Walsh. Have a great weekend. See you next week. 
The executive producer of The Matt Wall Show is Sean Hampton. Our associate producer is McKenna Waters. The show is directed by Mark Jones and Trey Miller. Our production manager is Austin Michaelis. The show is edited by Jeff Tomlin. Our lead audio engineer is Mike Coromina. Our audio engineer is Ryan Reese. Our hair and makeup artists are Cherokee Hart and Andrea Bauer. Our wardrobe stylists are Kristen Galarraga and Cameron Lasko. The director of production is Mathis Glover. Our director of post-production is Matthew Kemp. The director of studio operations is Pavel Vodowski. Camera studio and equipment management is Patrick Kennedy. Our chief broadcast engineer is Jeff Govin. And our assistant broadcast engineer is Allegra Rohr. Our lighting director, Keith Duggan. The show designers are Kat Darnell and Cynthia Angulo. Episode thumbnails are created by Grace Gordon and Clay Heider. Our playback operators are Finn Pope and CJ Hickish. And our show assistant is Holly Pratt. Our production assistants are Mike Moran and Zach Lewis. Executive in charge of production is David Wormus. Executive producer is Jeremy Boring. The Matt Wall Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2024. Hi, this is Andrew Clavin. If you like American flags and automatic weapons and shaking your fist at homosexuals while fighter jets fly over in formation, come to The Andrew Clavin Show. We don't have any of that. But we will be making fun of idiots and praising God and laughing our way through the fall of the republic. It's like an insane asylum for happy people. That's The Andrew Clavin Show right here on Daily Wire Plus.